type of ophthalmologist and we've got some a couple of excellent panel members here that will introduce themselves shortly. We're basically going to try to just educate folks about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare as it's commonly known. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, how we ended up with this law, why it's the way it is, and then they're going to deal with more of the details and the mechanics and hopefully help some of you guys figure out how the law can benefit you. The first thing I think that's important whenever anyone gives you a talk is a disclaimer, where the money comes from. I'm a part of the healthcare system, okay? This is a very cynical photograph from an article in the New York Times showing a patient being an ATM machine. The system makes more money if you get sick. The sicker you get, the more money we make, the more things we do to you, the more things, the more money that comes into the system. So you should keep that in mind when someone like myself speaks to you. Uh, hopefully at some point you'll, uh, you'll, you'll appreciate what I'm saying even if you think I'm nuts. But, but in any event, I think it's important to at least get that out of the way for anyone that talks about these different things. The, the biggest, most fundamental problem of our healthcare system is that everything costs a lot of money. This is all the other healthcare systems in the world. This purple line is the American healthcare system. I would like to convince you that that purple line, wherever you are, whoever you are, that reaches into your pocket and plucks money away from you. And it's a real big deal. This is all the per capita expenses from all the countries around the world in terms of healthcare. This is the average. This is America right here. We're paying way more than anyone else. As a matter of fact, the dark blue here is what we pay in taxes. Okay, that's our government-run healthcare system. We actually could have the healthcare system of Austria, Germany, France, or something like that, just for our taxes. But our taxes, Medicare and Medicaid, really only pay a fraction of the healthcare for maybe 20 to 30 percent of us. Where our healthcare system is so inefficient that we can't even get our money's worth. And of course, a lot of folks will talk about why it's so expensive. We usually blame Americans not being healthy or people that make bad decisions, whatever. It's not, it's not any of those things. All those things contribute a little bit, but the fundamental thing is from this paper here, it's the price is stupid. America, everything is far more expensive than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and this is an anecdote to kind of illustrate this. We do a test in my office called a fluorescein angiogram. Depending on how recently you bought your camera and how much your text and what your rent is, it costs maybe about a hundred bucks to do the test. Medicare pays me about 250 to do the test, and most doctors' offices will have the Medicare rate, which is spelled out by the government, and a private insurance rate, which is usually higher if you can get it from the private insurance companies. And our private charge several years ago was about $450. I had a patient come into my office one day, and if you ever want to get your doctor's attention, the quickest thing is to say what this patient told me. He said, Doctor, stupid. And he showed me a bill. He had gone to a, to a retina specialist group in another big city, and they had billed him $1,200 for this test. In other words, they made $1,100 on a $100 test. And the most amazing thing is the insurance company paid for it. Okay? And you can imagine that when we set our rates the next year, we didn't go down. I mean, my partner and I were not buccaneers. Uh, we went to like 550 or something like that. But it, what, you, what I'm trying to convey is for the past several decades in America, people have been able to charge almost whatever they wanted. And if you can understand how if, if I saw, wow, that doc with 1200 bucks, well, I'm going to try 1400 bucks. Well, I'm going to try 2000 bucks. And that's why you get these massive bills from the hospitals because over the past several decades, people have been able to charge incredibly high amounts of money for things and actually get paid for it. And it shows. This is just a, a bunch of different things. There's about, this is a list of comparing what other countries pay versus America. The purple bar is America in every single case across the board, whether it's procedures, whether it's drugs, whether it's surgeries, whether it's office visits. Everything in America is far more expensive probably than it needs to be. As a matter of fact, this graph shows an estimate of income going up gradually this line is the health care cost, what people pay for insurance, going up and up and up. And the estimate is somewhere around 2025, people will have to pay their annual salary just to get insurance. A married couple, one person will work for insurance, another person will work for income. If you're single, I guess, you know, you're stuck. But the point is, this is an incredibly large amount of money that you're all paying. You could almost argue it's thousands of dollars more than it needs to be. Now, 
The big problem is the Affordable Care Act doesn't really address that, but that's the driving problem. Everything is real expensive. Years ago, there was so much money sloshing around in our health care system that you could almost, it didn't make much difference. There was plenty of money for insurance companies, drug companies, doctors, providers, but now that things are getting so expensive and there's less money, we're feeling the pinch. But the other problem with our health care system is the uninsured, okay? Uh, for some folks, it's a moral issue. It results in 45,000 deaths per year. Every day I see people struggling to keep from going blind, to stay alive in our health care system. And, and for a lot of folks, that's just a fundamental ethical driver right there. But there's another viewpoint that I think has equal validity. Uh, and it's equally important, important to address. A lot of feel, people feel that it's not fair, that it's immoral, that someone should pick their pockets, take money from them, to pay for other people's health care, particularly if they perceive that those other people don't really deserve health care. And again, there's no right or wrong here. These are feelings, and if anything, this permeates our health care system more than the previous one. But I'd like to point out that we're all in this together. The big problem is if we have a whole bunch of people that are uninsured, it costs us all money. When those uninsured go to the hospital, they can't pay their bills, the hospital shifts the costs onto us. That's that's one way where having a bunch of uninsured people cost money. Of course, the uninsured are often sicker, too. And because they're sicker, their care costs more. And because they often put off care until they're really sick, and then they're down and out for a while, we lose productivity. People have estimated that it costs about five times more in terms of loss of productivity, cost of care, for us to keep a whole bunch of people uninsured. These are some of the reasons why... Obamacare wanted to try to address the problem of the uninsured because at some fundamental level it costs us money. But it's worse than that. And this is something that most folks don't realize. Uh, hang on a second here. When you have a bunch of uninsured people in the community, they get in your way. Okay? They're sicker, they're more ill. When they hit the health care system, they clog it up. It's estimated that for every 10% increase in uninsured, Everyone that has worked and got their insurance and struggled and made sure they're taking care of themselves, there's a 7% chance that they are more likely to, get, to, to not get the care they need, to be delayed, to have these <coughs> uninsured in the way. As a matter of fact, a study looking in California estimated that about 1 in 25 people with a heart attack presenting to hospitals in Northern California died because resources were tied up with uninsured folks that shouldn't have been that sick. So again, having a lot of uninsured ethically is kind of a frustrating thing. It's humanitarian-wise, it's really bad that we do this to our fellow human being. But it also costs us money, and it risks your health when there's that many people out there. And again, that's something the ACA was trying to address. And there's something else. This is just a great right-clicked off the internet, very trustworthy. It must have been for some ad or something, some, some doctor. You know, I'd let this guy slice me open. No big deal. He looks like he's got it, <laughs> even if it's like a cheap loaner stethoscope. But, uh, but the point is, when, any, when you have a staff physician or attending physician or boss doctor, that's good. It's not so much in Fort Wayne, but certainly in other big cities, that doctor is surrounded by trainees, student doctors. Okay, residents, physicians, doctors that are trying to learn their trade and they're learning what this guy knows as he treats patients. Now, if this doctor tells you that you need some really complicated surgery or tells you that your family member needs some really complicated surgery, what's the first thing you think? You're telling that doctor, don't let those student doctors touch me. I want you. I want you to take care of me. That's understandable. That's very reasonable. I hear it all the time in my office, but the problem is, how did this guy get good? Okay, he had to be trained, he had to learn, he had to figure out what's going on. In America, a lot of that's done on prisoners, poor people. It's not like they're getting experimented on. It's just in the big, urban, inner-city hospitals, those folks have no choice to go there, and that's where the training programs are, and they provide excellent care because they've got good doctors watching the students. But if you suddenly decide that you don't want to take care of a whole bunch of people and you cut back on those kind of resources, then you are endangering yourself. Your doctors may not be as well trained. I, I trained at a hospital in Northern California, Highland General Hospital, very much a county hospital. And for instance, there was some tragic heroin addict diabetic. 
And, you know, I, I think a lot of people go, wow, I don't, my money going to pay for these, this kind of stuff. It's, it's a difficult thing. But, but that guy would go out and get, him, get himself horribly sick every two weeks, and the medicine service would admit him, and doctors would learn vast amounts about how to manage complex diseases, simply because there were resources available to take care of him. And again, that's another thing the ACA was trying to address, the fact that, by having a whole bunch of people that are uninsured, it really is dangerous for most of us. It's important to understand that the great paradox of our healthcare system, not caring for people costs us all money and it risks our health. And the more you try to avoid covering for people, the more you're going to pay. And of course, up until January 1st, you could have been in that boat. All it would take would be a car accident, cancer, your job shutting down, you're losing your insurance, and suddenly you're in that pool of people they can't get care. So we got the Affordable Care Act dealing with incredibly high prices, but not directly dealing with it. We got it trying to deal with getting people covered so they can get access to the health care system. There's one huge player in the Affordable Care Act that we need to include, and that is the for-profit insurance industry. And I want to distinguish between for-profit and non-profit. There are many smaller non-profit insurance like PHP here in Towner, some Blue Crosses up in Michigan that have a very different approach. I'm talking about the big ones, Humana, United, Cigna, WellPoint. Those are the ones that had a profound effect on how this law shit was shaped. And in order to stand, understand healthcare in America and the uh, Obamacare, this is an incredibly crucial graph. What this does is it shows the percentages of population based on how much healthcare they use up. And it turns out that only about 20% of the population, this really sick group here, accounts for about 86% of the dollars. Okay, the vast majority of us are very, very healthy. And you've heard, you know, when they talk about the financial crisis, America manages to socialize risk while letting individuals reap the benefits. You know, the, we bail out the banks and we do all those things during the, the financial crisis and help those places, but then they still get to reap the profits. And healthcare is very similar. We, the taxpayers of America, have got these folks, okay? We've got the oldest, we've got the sickest, we've got the poorest, we've got Medicare, Medicaid. Our tax dollars are going largely to take care of these folks, and we allow the for-profit insurance companies access to this gap. You remember the big fuss about how President Obama lied. He said people could keep their insurance if they wanted to, and suddenly people were losing their insurance policies it's because this group here that's very healthy, you can insure them with pixie dust if you needed to because they're going to be healthy. It's free money for insurance companies. So for years, on the individual market, the companies have given these people these real crummy insurance plans, the mini meds, the various things, these really bad plans that are relatively cheap, but it doesn't make that much difference because most of these people don't get sick, so they don't understand how bad their plan is. Well, when the exchanges opened up, that allowed those companies to make three to four times more off of these people, so they dropped them from those crummy plans and tried to force them onto the exchange because then the insurance company can make more money. But the point here is a lot of people don't require a lot of cash to take care of them. And if you're in charge of a for-profit insurance company, you want to make darn sure that you can gather these folks up and try to unload those on anybody else that will take care of them, and in this case, the, uh, the American taxpayer. And it doesn't get more pithy than this. This is Angela Braley, <coughs> former CEO of WellPoint. She wasn't talking to doctors, providers, regular folks. She was talking to stock analysts. She was trying to get them to invest in her company. And she said, we will not sacrifice profitability for membership. In other words, our profits are more important than the people we take care of. Okay, it's just, I mean, there it is right there. A friend of mine said, I'm surprised she didn't end up at the bottom of an elevator shaft for being that honest. <laughs> but, but the point is, in order to slice this up like that, that requires a lot of bureaucracy. This is another scary slide showing the number of physicians, the yellow down here, but the buildup of administrators. And some of this is bureaucracy, government control instructions, but a lot of it is underwriting, dividing people up, advertising, administrators, all these to figure out all the networks of benefits and plans. We have this huge excess of administrative costs brought on by all of these different for-profit plans because they're so busy slicing us up. Now, this is a, a complex issue, but simply to point out in terms of moving the money around, a for-profit insurance company is never going to be efficient because they've got all these things, executive salaries, advertising, underwriters, 
Whereas Medicare can move the money around much cheaper, much more efficiently. We can talk more about Medicare overall, but my point is there are more efficient ways to at least pay for health care than using the for-profit insurance companies. And the big problem for those companies is about five to ten years ago, things were not looking good for them. Okay, we started to see movies about the techniques they would use, rescissions, the different things. Uh, a book about, you know, uh, exposés about how they work. Horrible outcomes that the insurance companies were getting blamed for. Blogs, insurance companies kill people. This, this kind of bad publicity. And those companies knew that they better not keep pushing their luck. They knew they had to do something because if people started to ask, hey, can I just get on Medicare, please? That's going to blow those companies out of the water because they can't compete with that. So they knew they had to start covering people. They knew they had to do something to show that they were worth it to us. But they couldn't make money covering those people. And most people can't afford their product. That's the whole problem with the, why the Affordable Care Act was created in the first place. Uh, it was because these, their products are so expensive. So again, there's lots of good things in Obamacare covers more uninsured, explores way to control cost, it improves the quality of insurance. The most awesome thing we got out of that law is it eliminates pre-existing conditions. I mean, that's just every other person in every developed country in the world doesn't have to worry about that. And now for the first time, Americans are getting a taste of what that's like. But in order to do that, we had to twist the law to the benefit of those for-profit insurance companies. That's why we have the mandates, the subsidies, the enforcement, the bailouts, the, the, the website that we've heard so much about. To get more specific, the mandate is to force these people to buy their products. I mean, you cannot ask those companies to actually start covering sick people. They start screaming and they say, no, give us access to these folks. Make these people buy our products. So not only do we have the mandate, but taxpayers have to pay for the enforcement. They can't, no one can afford their products, so taxpayers have to give these people money to go ahead and buy the product for the for-profit insurance companies. And because they know they'd still end up getting stuck with sick people, they want to make sure they could unload it on us with Medicaid, Medicare, state high risk pools. It's not well known, but there's a bailout clause in the ACA where if the insurance companies bring in too many sick people and they start to actually lose money or they don't make their 20% profit specifically, then they can go to Medicare and ask for reimbursements. They can get paid if they end up with too many sick patients by us. And of course, they absolutely did not want a real public option. They didn't want anyone to get a chance to get their hands on some of the things that people over 65 can get. And it, and it shows the, the law was in part written by Elizabeth Fowler. She was an executive for WellPoint uh, back in 2009. Six months before the law passed, this article showed up in Business Week. The health insurers have already won. Okay, whatever shape the law was going to take, whatever was going to end up being passed, the insurance companies had nailed what they wanted out of the law. I think the most damning comment is from this book I mentioned, an expose by Wendell Potter, who's a former vice president of public relations for Cigna. This is intense. And if you were persuaded that the health care bill was a government takeover of the health care system, my former colleagues and I earned every penny of our handsome salaries. <laughs> what were we doing back then? We were fighting, screaming at town hall meetings, government takeover, no government takeover, yes, no, just fighting like crazy. This guy slipped in and created a system that benefits them a great deal. And it, it's very complicated. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go very long here, just a few more minutes, because there's really, we want to get to the, how the plan works for you. But there's about 56 pages of loopholes in the plan, in the law, just to make sure those companies actually do what they're supposed to do. This is just a screenshot of one half of one page of this form. And of course, everyone knows that it's super complicated. That's because we had to make room for those for-profit companies in between providers and payers. And so we end up this, with this incredibly complex system. And I think it's really important to understand that as we move forward, you're going to hear people blame Obamacare for everything. And sometimes they're right, but most of the time they're generalizing. We gave Obamacare up to those companies in, that, that have to avoid paying for us if they're going to make money. Uh, and fundamentally, 
Obamacare is going to be blamed for everything, like I said, as we explore our new complicated world that hopefully, you know, we can educate you about. You remember that the rules, regulations, complexity, confusion in Obamacare exists because we've decided that it's more important to protect those companies than to protect ourselves. And again, I'm not specifically slamming the law itself. I'm just hoping that as you move into this world that we're now entering, you won't let someone say, oh, this is happening because of Obamacare, or it's not happening because of Obamacare. Dig in. There's some fundamental issues going on here, fundamental forces and powers that most people aren't aware of, and it's mind-boggling that the law has been portrayed as a government takeover of health care, when in fact it's a corporate takeover of a government's attempt to expand access to health care. So that's the basics of where the law came from. Why don't we fire the lights back up and actually get some folks involved here that, that know about the law. Been much less than this, given everyone Medicare to start with, and then we could add all the bells and whistles, all of this complexity disappears. Obviously, that's a big debate. People may disagree. But as we go into this system and start to experience this, I think it's worth keeping in mind that there's lots of other ways of running a healthcare system that we don't even talk about much in America. There's some information on the pamphlets over there if you're interested. Any other questions? Uh, I appreciate everybody coming and trying to enlighten us. Uh, I'm not sure I feel enlightened. <laughs> the thing is, I probably haven't been paying close attention because, you know, I'm 80 years old now. I'm on Medicare. I also go to the VA for my health care, so I really don't need this. But there are a lot of people here who do. And I really worry for them. How many of you really understood, and don't be afraid to raise your hand, how many of you really understood all of this today? Okay. How many of you are still confused? Quite a few. Okay. And which isn't, which isn't, okay. <laughs> which isn't, uh, you know, to say anything against you folks. But you know what? And I think we're probably getting ready to wrap up here. Uh, but uh, all of the industrialized nations in the world, all of them, have health care for everyone, except us. And the last poll I heard was that two-thirds of the American people want universal health care. Two-thirds of the American people want it. My question to any of you, if you're brave enough to take a stab at this, is why in the hell don't we have it? You've heard of lobbyists, right? <laughs> yes. I like, I'll take her answer. Okay, so it's because <laughs> our Congress people are being paid off? It's, I think it's more complicated than that. Okay. I mean, but some people would actually Make argue, it simple for so, us. Well, some people would actually argue that oh, oh, the Affordable Care Act actually gives us universal health care. It works in the same system that I believe it's the Swiss system works on, which is a mandated insurance for everyone. No, 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 no. Come on. I mean, how many people saw the movie Sicko, for God's sake? Where I'm, just, are you I'm, going? Just, I'm, just, I'm just telling you that there are other countries that have universal health care that operate on the same system that yeah. the Affordable Care Act operates on, which is mandated health care. But that doesn't mean that it will work here. Right, so that may be a different argument. Right, but we still pride ourselves, you know, being Americans, as being number one. The, the reality is that whatever we do, we have to pay for it. And the, you know, as well as I do, that when anybody talks about adding anything more in taxes, there are people who say, we absolutely will not ever allow any more taxes. In fact, we want to cut taxes. Yeah, we will. Well, taxes pay for things we want. Right. They pay for the roads. They pay for the schools. Right. They pay for how much is too much. There's a balance there somewhere. And we get into that discussion of are we going, because their European countries pay a lot more in taxes. They get a lot more in government services. Is that what we want? Obviously not, because nobody ends up doing that. So maybe if we cut our defense budget in half, I, I would also we might say have that the one money. One of our problems is, is that we don't we don't say no in healthcare, um, and so as a result, so one of it is is higher costs, but the other is is that we pay lots and lots of money 
for things that of the countries that have universal coverage would say no. They would say we're not. That, that's something that's, that's that's a bridge too far. And part of the problem we have in the United States, and my father-in-law told me this, so I think it's the best the best way to describe it. Everyone's willing to ration health care for their neighbor. And so well, this is our problem. I, yeah. Listen, I'd like to publicly acknowledge the tremendous work that this man here, John Walker, and Edith Kenna, and maybe a few other people have been doing in this area to try to get universal health care. I think they deserve a round of applause. And also our other panelists who actually understand the law, or at least know enough yeah, about it to give advice. Amen. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.